This morning we light the Bethlehem candle, the candle of preparation, as we anticipate the dawning and the arrival of hope. But maybe this morning hope feels like the furthest thing from your mind. Let this be a moment to prepare your heart for the work of hope God wants to unfold in you. In the traditional Christmas hymn, O Holy Night, we sing the line, A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. And in this season, I think we can agree that the world feels weary, tired, burdened, and we might ask then, how is it that a weary world can rejoice? Where does the root of that praise spring from? The next line in the hymn says that we rejoice because yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. In other words, there is hope on the horizon. Hear now the words of that prophet in Isaiah 9, verse 2. It says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. It goes on to say in verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The seal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You who are weary, take heart. You who are burdened out, take heart also. You who feel broken, ashamed, crushed in spirit, take heart. Because hope is on the horizon, ready to break forth by God's grace. Do you believe this morning that hope is on the horizon? That even now it breaks forth? This morning we lit the candle of, uh, the Bethlehem candle or the candle of preparation. And what I like about this is it's an invitation in this Advent season to think about the condition of your heart and to begin to prepare yourself for the work of transformation and discipleship that God wants to unfold in you uh, during the season of Advent. I think in a lot of ways, the season of Advent is a season of disruption. Now, now maybe those words in your mind, Advent and disruption, you don't see those going together, but, but hear me out for a second. I think Advent is a season of disruption uh, because Webster's Dictionary defines disruption this way. They say it's an interruption in the normal course of things. Now, I don't know if I'm just getting older or slowing down or what, but in my mind, the world just keeps picking up pace. Anybody else feel that? It just seems like it keeps going faster and faster and faster. And when I got, had kids, it sped up even faster. And now I feel like sometimes I get to the end of the day and I think, man, what, what just happened? And a month's passed and years pass, and, and life is, is it's just quick. And oftentimes it's he hectic and chaotic. And especially in the season that we've just come through of global pandemic and economic upheaval and political upheaval, all the things, right? It just feels chaotic. But Advent is this invitation to disruption. It's an invitation to have this moment where we set aside the normal course of things and enter into a specific season of reflection. I think this is part of the beauty of the church calendar, the church ryth rhythm, the church year. It's a moment to pause, to step back and to say, am I preparing my heart and life to enter this season for what God wants to do? Now, I've said Advent is a season of disruption, but I, I want to uh, flesh this out because not all disruption is good, right? There's some disruption that's, that's healthy, like an Advent disruption where we're invited to reflect on the condition of our heart and to think about the coming of Jesus and his second coming that will, uh, is still in our future. But there's challenges, uh, other challenges that are disrupting in uh, a more difficult way. And this morning, I want us to think about the season of life that we've just come through and how do we navigate disruption in a way that is transformative and even constructive. In December of 1914, uh, World War I was underway, and World War I was a particularly brutal uh, war. It was sort of the birth of modern warfare, so tanks were just entering the scene, machine guns were entering the scene, and, and World War I was fought uh, trench to trench. So you have two opposing sets of troops in each trench, and, and basically one set of troops would get up and charge across what they called no man's land, because as soon as they charged out of the trench, machine gun fire would rain down and casualties were high. But in December of 1914, this unique thing happened. There was uh, this specific night, it was cold and the troops were tired. They had been facing the brutality of this uh, war for months. And historians aren't really sure where it started, on which side, but somebody started singing a Christmas carol. 
It was primarily the French and German soldiers who were engaged in conflict at this time. And uh, so one side sang a Christmas carol and there was a law. And then lo and behold, the enemy troops, they were close enough they could hear, they started singing a Christmas carol. And, and back and forth, it was almost like the weirdest Christmas concert you've ever had, right? In, in a battle moment, these sides are singing Christmas carols back and forth. And then it gets even crazier. And again, historians aren't sure where it started, but somebody emerged and they called out, if you don't shoot, we won't shoot. And they, they estimate up to 100,000 troops, oh, enemies, op- opposites, got up out of the trenches and they met together in no man's land. They started exchanging gifts. There's reports that some of them started kicking around a soccer ball and, and who were once enemies locked in battle. There was a disruption in the fighting and they had this moment of peace. It's called the Christmas Truce of 1914. You can Google it. Now, the soldiers on the front line, they said, if it was up to us, we're, we're, we're not sure another, another shot would have been fired. Maybe the war would have ended there. And so for the soldiers on the front line, it was a healthy moment of disruption, but not everybody saw it that way, right? Their commanders, one commander said this, he goes, I'm not sure this is good for morale because there is still a war to fight. How do I get my soldiers to fight when they've been fraternizing and exchanging gifts? One Bavarian soldier, he said it this way. He said, I'm not sure that there is a sense of honor in in parleying with the enemy and exchanging gifts with the enemy. By the way, that Bavarian soldier's name was Adolf Hitler. Now, everybody experienced the same disruption, but not everybody approached it from the same perspectives. For the soldiers on the front line, it was a welcome reprieve. For the commanders up the chain of command, it was an annoyance and a frustration. The difference was in the perspective and circumstance that they brought to that moment of disruption. Now, I know we're sick of hearing it, right? But we are in a season of disruption. I mentioned the political upheaval, the economic upheaval, a global pandemic. And the reality is we have navigated a season of disruption. And the question I want to put before us today is how will we navigate that? Because it can either be a moment of of frustration and fear, or it can be a, a moment of calling attention to what God wants to do in our heart and lives in this season. So the key question I want to invite you to wrestle with me with this morning is how do we navigate that season of disruption? How do we do it in a healthy way? And and to flesh that out this morning, I want to look at the story and the example of Joseph, who I will argue navigated a significant moment of disruption. If you would join me in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, again, I will argue that Joseph navigated a significant moment of disruption. So think about this. Joseph and Mary are a young couple and they're betrothed, which in this culture, betrothal is, is, is more significant than our engagement. It's not just that they're engaged. In, in the Jewish culture at this time, if Joseph were to die, Mary would have been considered a widow. Um, you know that, that Joseph is wrestling with the, the scenes that have merged and he has in mind to divorce her. So the marriage hasn't been consummated yet. They're not husband and wife strictly, but yet it's more than engagement. So this is a big deal. Their lives are committed together. And you can imagine as a young couple, they are excited about their life together. Now, as a pastor, I have the privilege of performing lots of weddings. Um, Some summers, it's between eight and 10 weddings in a summer. And in every wedding, I get to sit down with a young couple who's excited and, and there's always this sense of anticipation, right? They have all these plans. And occasionally I have a bride who's got the day broken down in five minute increments. And I would say, let's talk about disruption because you're going to experience that. That plan is not going to happen, right? But there's this eager anticipation and they can't wait. And they're, they're maybe talking about the house that they're going to build or the family that they're going to have. And there's just this joy and excitement. And, and I would like to think that Joseph and Mary have a similar sense of joy and excitement. You know, Mary's telling Joseph about, you know, how, how, what our home will look like and the kind of family we'll have. And then there's this moment, right? Stop the record, screech, boom, done. Mary is found to be pregnant. 
that there was a whole hitch in the plan, right? So now Joseph is, you can just imagine what he's thinking, right? He's betrothed to Mary. This is a significant moment of commitment, vowing to spend his life with her. And now she's found to be pregnant. Now at this point, at the beginning of Matthew chapter one, verse 18, in in the beginning of this uh, story, Joseph doesn't yet know what's happened. His assumption is that Mary has been unfaithful. And we know this is his assumption because he has in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, at least he doesn't want to expose her to public shame. So he thinks, well, I'll just sever ties and quietly go my own way and she can do her own thing. But this is a significant disruption in the plans that Joseph had for his own life. And the question becomes, how will he navigate this thing? And and I think that's the similar question that I want to wrestle with. How do we navigate disruption in a way that's healthy? Now, let me talk through a little bit of the dynamics of disruption. When when a disruption happens, right, you have this plan that you've set forth. You have a direction for your life. When that's disrupted, suddenly all that goes out the window and it can be challenging. It can be difficult. It can feel like the clarity that you had in your life direction suddenly disappeared maybe. But what I want to suggest to you is that a moment of disruption can actually be an invitation to significant discipleship. I want to suggest to you that that moment where suddenly the plan that you had for your life becomes unclear, that can actually become a substantial moment of spiritual maturity in your life. Let me listen uh, to this, uh, how James describes it in James chapter one, verse two. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And I'll be honest with you, when I was reading that this week, I was like, ooh, God, I'm not sure I'm allowed to even talk about this verse because... I'll be honest, when the global pandemic COVID stuff hit in March, I didn't even have impure joy. I had no joy, right? Anybody feel me? Who looked at this last season we've gone through and was like, God, you know, I'm just, it's pure joy for all the things that have disrupted, for my graduation that got canceled, for my family members in assisted living that I can't see, for, I mean, you name it, right? We've all felt this disruption. And I look at that and go, pure joy? Are you serious? But but listen to what James says. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know, catch this, that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And sometimes I wonder if God doesn't disrupt our plans to bring us to a place of trial and testing because it produces perseverance that when it's uh, brought to its fruition, it brings us to a place of maturity and completion spiritually. I don't like it. I wish there was an easier way. The problem is I'm too strong-willed. I'm too boneheaded. I don't learn well enough unless God disrupts my plan because in my arrogance, I think I'm pretty competent and capable. I can do life. I can come up with a plan. And then when that plan goes out the window, I'll be the first in line to be like, God, what are you doing? But maybe that's precisely the place that God wants us to bring us through to disciple us and to bring us to a place of Christian maturity. Now, I think there's a couple ways we can respond. On the one hand, we can respond in fear and frustration. When when our plans go out the window, we can respond with, God, what are you doing? This isn't what I had in mind. How am I going to make it through? But I think there's another way that we can respond that is both faithful and fruitful if we'll continue to trust that God is unfolding something purposeful even in a season of disruption. So do you believe that a moment of disruption can actually be a significant moment of discipleship? Secondly, I I want to suggest to you this reality, that disruption discloses character. That when our plan, our nice little, we've got life figured out, when that goes out the window and you encounter a moment of trial and struggle and difficulty, often it has a way of disclosing who we are underneath. Sometimes we're pretty good at faking it, aren't we? We've got enough emotional intelligence. We've got enough wherewithal to put on a good front. The problem is when you hit a moment of trial and struggle, all those filters go out the window and who we are begins to float to the surface when the pressure's on. Now, I think the same thing is true of Joseph. Uh, Listen to what happens in verse 19. So he finds out Mary's pregnant, verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, but he didn't want to dispose her to disgrace. Notice what it says. Joseph is described as someone who was faithful to the law. Now we hear faithful to the law and I think we immediately go to, well, that sounds legalistic. That's not how the Jewish audience would receive this. Faithful to the law means that Joseph is someone who has aligned his life with both the word and the ways of God. In fact, if you have the NIV, there's a footnote there. And rather than translating it faithful to the law, it can also be translated, Joseph was righteous. 
To be righteous means, that again, that his life is aligned with both the word of God, God's truth, and the ways of God. In other words, Joseph actually lives out what he believes the word of God says. And, and this is a descriptor of Joseph's character. Now, the rest of this story is, is going to answer this question. That's how he's described. Does he live up to that description? And I will argue that this moment of disruption discloses that, yes, in fact, Joseph is a person of righteous character. So let me, let me ask you this question. What has been revealed in your heart during a season of disruption? All those things we listed, the challenging season that we've gone through culturally, socially. What has that season of disruption revealed in your heart? Both good and challenging. And, and part of what I want to suggest to you is we need to have the kind of decisive um, decision that Joseph has to build our life on the right foundation. So he, here's what I want to suggest to you. Joseph has answered this question for his life about what is foundational. That description of his character, Joseph was a righteous man, means that for him, the foundation of his life was the word and the ways of God. Let, let me ask you this question. What is foundational to your life? I, I think culturally, our culture says what you should value is things like power, status, success, financial stability. All of those things are what's really important. Now, those things aren't inherently wrong. The problem is we tend to take those things and say those are the foundational components and realities of, of life. So what's foundational for you? What values, principles, and beliefs are you building your life on? And the reason this matters is because as you build your life on a foundation, that builds into a sense of vision for your life. The principles, values, and beliefs that you have build into a sense of vision for your life. If your foundation is wealth, power, status, success, and, and keeping up with the Joneses, your dream for your life will be things like the corner office, you know, the right... Um, pay package, uh, owning a nice house, nice cars, all those things. Again, not inherently bad, but often that becomes the sole focus of life. Now, out of a, the foundation, the values, principles, beliefs you're building on, out of that vision that, that is formed out of that uh, comes the decisions that you make day in and day out. Now, I think most of us, we like to think we operate here just making decisions independently. But I think our decisions are driven by the values, beliefs, principles that we have, by the vision that emerges from that. And out of that, we make day-to-day -day decisions. And overall, this builds into the sense of direction that we have for our life. Now, for Joseph, right, how was he described? Verse 19, he was a righteous man, meaning he had aligned his life with the words and the ways of God. What that means is all of this changes. It's not just a foundation, but Joseph has a godly foundation that gives him a godly sense of vision for his life that allows him to make godly decisions and move his life in a godly direction. And sometimes a moment of disruption, it discloses our character and has a way of revealing what's foundational. So again, in the season of disruption, what has been disclosed in your heart and life? Maybe for some of us, we realize that what was actually foundational to us was our economic stability. Maybe for some of us, what we realized was that our foundation was actually in our identity that's wrapped up in our vocation and what we do for work. What has this season of disruption revealed about the foundational things in your life and revealed about your heart and your character? Now, I think the challenging part of this, right, is we have a foundation, we have a sense of vision for our life, we're making decisions, we've established a sense of disruption or a sense of direction. Now what's, what happens is this little thing called disruption enters the scene, right? And disruption has a way of making the direction that we're headed in life, that plan that you've got all put together, disruption has a way of making that all seem unclear. And, and what I've noticed is that when disruption enters the scene, this is the opportunity to make detours, and, and I think if we don't have a strong sense of foundation, I watch people make really bad decisions in a season of disruption because they haven't rightly rooted their life in righteous living in both the word and the ways of God. And suddenly there's this disruption and the direction that you've been moving your life suddenly seems unclear. The question is, how do you navigate the way forward? Now, I think there's two potential detours that, that we are tempted to take. The first potential detour is this. I think we're often tempted to simply take control. We'll, we'll develop a plan, we'll put it in place, 
right? Where once maybe I was kind of trusting God's word and God's ways. Now when, when there's a disruption and all that seems to go out the window, it's okay, I've got to come up with a plan. I'll take control. I'll call my own shots for my life. Now I want to suggest to you that, that Joseph considers this, right? Look at uh, chapter one, verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So they have this life that they're planning together. They're going to get married. Disruption enters the scene. Their direction becomes really cloudy. Joseph's now thinking, what kind of decision do I make? How do I navigate this? And he goes, I know what I'll do. I, I don't want it to be punitive. I'll, I'll, I'll divorce her quietly. Right? He has this in mind, verse 20, after he'd considered this, right? He, he's, he's got it in mind. He's thinking about it. He's considering it. He puts this plan in place. And for Joseph, in a lot of ways, it makes sense to carry this out, right? At this point, he doesn't know that this is a miraculous conception. He, all he knows at this point is that Mary must have been unfaithful. And so he comes up with this plan. And I think oftentimes we're tempted to come up with a plan that's independent of God's righteous living, that's independent of God's plan and purpose for our life. And so rather than stopping to ask God, what would you have me do? We put our own plan in place and push forward. Now, the other option we have in this moment, I think, is to continue to, continue to trust what God is doing and purposely unfolding in a season of disruption. Can you trust, faithfully trust God's direction, even in a season of disruption. And this is why foundations matter, because a right foundation keeps us rooted in righteous living. One of the other detours that I see happen when disruption enters is I see a lot of people make character compromises in a season of disruption, because what we find out is our foundation was on a lot of other things. And so when there's a lack of clarity in our direction, because we've encountered disruption, we look for comfort, security, safety, wherever we can. And I've watched a lot of people make decisions and do things they would not otherwise do because of the uncertainty of disruption. And what I want to suggest to you is rather than coming up with our own plan and carrying out things our way independently of God, I want us to be a people who consistently trust God's plan and purpose for our lives. One of the things um, my friend and mentor Bruce has, has guided me in is he said, you know, when you encounter a moment like this, there's his process that, that I've stolen it and considered for my own life. When you encounter a moment of disruption and you're trying to make a decision, I walk through this process of pause, pray, ponder, and proceed. Because what happens is when there's a disruption and direction becomes unclear, sometimes I don't know what decisions to make. You feel me? You, you feel that same tension? And often what I do is, is I go into panic mode. And it's like, okay, we got to be decisive. Let's make decisions. And sometimes I make really bad decisions because I'm just panically making decisions. So I think sometimes there's wisdom in slowing the process down. Just pause. Pray about it. Open up your life to God's wisdom and God's direction. God, what would you have me do here? Pray about it. And, and I know like that sounds weirdly like Sunday schoolish. Like, have you prayed about it? But there's so much truth to it. Right? And how often is it, okay, I've got to figure this out. I've got to come up with it on my own. Can I be honest with you? I'm not that good. And a lot of times I face scenarios where I don't even know the right decision to make. And there's deep wisdom, I think, in pausing and praying and say, God, would you give me wisdom that's beyond me to know how to navigate this? And when I talk about pondering it, I don't just mean reflecting on it. I mean, going back to the foundational things. God, what does the truth of your word say? How is that foundational to the decisions that I need to make? And only then proceed. Pause, pray, ponder, proceed. And out of that, root your life in a place where you can faithfully trust God's direction. Now, look what happens to, to Joseph. Verse 20, after he'd considered this, considered divorcing Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you were to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And what I want to suggest to you, right, Joseph hears that. Now look at verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded. I think that is one of the most profound passages in this whole passage or whole verses in this passage of scripture. He woke up and he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. He had in mind, I'm going to divorce Mary. I'm going to move on with my life. And the angel comes to him in a dream and says, Joseph, don't do that. Take her as your wife. Push forward in this thing, in this commitment that you've made to her. And I find it mind boggling that Joseph walks forward in obedience. 
And so as we look at his example of navigating disruption, Joseph was receptive to God's voice and he was obedient in what God called him to do. And and I want to suggest to you that we need to be also a people who are receptive and obedient even in the middle of a season of disruption. And I think the reason uh, Joseph was able to respond with receptivity and obedience was he had cultivated an attentiveness to the words and ways of God. Right? He, it's not inconsequential that in verse 19, he is described as a righteous person who's faithful to the law. The rhythm and pattern of Joseph's life is that he is rooted, founded in the righteous ways of God. Church, I want to be honest with you. I, I think part of our struggle with the season of disruption is that we're not rooted in deep discipleship. We are unanchored in a sea of distraction. Life is fast. It's quick, there's lots of stressors. And so we get home at the end of the day and we scroll on the phone for hours and then we turn on Netflix and we yell at the kids to get them in bed or, you know, take care of the house or whatever. And then we finally collapse and we stream Amazon Prime, Hulu, Netflix, scroll on the phone, do whatever. And we are drowning in a sea of distraction and our souls and spirits are anemic in the middle of the things that are going on around us. And in a sea of disruption where the church is to be a voice and beacon of hope, we are drowning in the middle of our own frustration because we haven't been rightly rooted and founded on the righteous ways that God has called us to live. And I think some of us, we go, okay, well, it's easy for Joseph, an angel came to him. If an angel came to me, maybe I would be obedient. But now think think about how this unfolds. Joseph thinks Mary has cheated on him, right? Thinks she's been unfaithful. Now, it's not like the angel appears in like, oh, angelic glory and light flat. Joseph falls asleep and he has a dream. Right? Now, I'll tell you, I am probably not a good a man as Joseph is. Almost guaranteed, right? Now, if I'm Joseph, I wake up and I'm like, I had the weirdest dream. What did I eat before bed? I had this crazy dream that an angel told me that Mary's pregnant, not because she was unfaithful, but because the Holy Spirit conceived a child in her. I mean, this is unheard of. This doesn't happen. If I'm Joseph, I'm like, oh boy, I better get that paperwork sooner than I thought. Right, but Joseph doesn't do that because he is a person who's described as righteous, who has built his foundation on the word and the ways of God. He responds in receptivity and obedience. He's able to receive this word that God is speaking to him and respond in a way that's obedient because he had cultivated a consistent attentiveness to the word and ways of God. And what you see in Joseph's example is that he lived out the character description that was given in verse 19. In verse 19, he is described as righteous. In verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel commanded him. He lives it out. And what we see in Joseph is that a season of disruption revealed him to be a person of true character. Could the same be said of us in a season of disruption? And and I think part of what's important in navigating a season of disruption is, again, to have your life founded and rooted on the righteous way of living that God calls us to in his word, but it's to operate out of a place of faith. Because I think faith in the middle of disruption, faith trusts and believes that God is unfolding a purpose, right? Look at verse 22. It says, all this took place, the virgin birth, the announcement of the angel to Joseph, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. That that means like, I think we read, we get so used to the Christmas story, right? We read it every year that I think we stop being scandalized by it. Don't don't look over this lightly and not think it was a season of suffering for Joseph. Can you imagine the trauma of the person he's planning to spend his life with? He assumes she's been unfaithful, right? This is a season of suffering for Joseph. This is a difficult moment, but it's not without meaning. It's not without purpose. All this happened, verse 22, because God is purposely unfolding and fulfilling the words of the prophets. And I think sometimes in a season of disruption in our faith uh, or in our frustration and fear, what we do is we go, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? And we begin to assume that maybe God is uh, capricious and purposeless and God just wakes up one day and decides, well, what do I want to do? That is not how God functions. God is always purposeful in everything that he does. And do you believe that even in the middle of a season of disruption, and and some of you, when I use that word disruption, for some of us, it's abstract. For some of you, it's very concrete. Some of you have encountered relational disruptions. Some of you have lost a job and you're facing economic disruptions. For some of us, this is very real and very tangible. But can we continue to trust and believe in faith that God is unfolding something purposeful? I, I think too, faith trusts and believe, believes that God is always present, 
I, I don't know about you, but when I hit a season of disruption and my plan goes out the window, I'm a little bit frustrated and confused. One of the first things I do is I say, God, what are you doing? Is there a purpose? And, I, and then I go, God, where are you? Do you not see what I'm wrestling with here? Do you not see what I'm dealing with here? Where are you in the midst of this? And, and the promise of, of the gospel of Matthew, he will be Emmanuel, which is God with us. And by the way, one of, one of the things that I noticed this year, I've never noticed this about the gospel of Matthew. Did you know the gospel of Matthew begins and ends with the promise of Jesus' presence? Check this out. Uh, Matthew chapter one, verse 23. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Right? There's this prophetic proclamation that his name, Emmanuel, will mean that God dwells with his people. Now, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, this is the Great Commission. Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he says, I want you to go. You're a sent people. Go and make disciples. And the very last sentence of the Gospel of Matthew is this. Teach those disciples to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I've never noticed that the gospel of Matthew begins and ends with this promise of Jesus always being present with his people. And by the way, the end of the age is when Jesus returns and is finally and fully present with his people physically. There is never a time when God is not present. And this gospel of Matthew is a promise from the very beginning, Emmanuel, God with us, all the way through Jesus promises again, Matthew 28, 20, I will be with you even to the end of the age. So I think in, in a season of disruption like this, I, I was thinking about, okay, how do, how do I, what's the application moment for something like this? And, and I kept coming back to the Advent candle, the candle of preparation. And so what, what I want to leave you with is just is three questions that as we enter this Advent season and think about the anticipation of what it must have been like to wait for the Messiah, for the people of Israel. And, and now we live on the other side of that hope, but we're anticipating Christ's second coming when everything is finally and fully redeemed. As we enter the season, I want you to wrestle with these questions. What does God want to form in me? Listen, don't let Advent become so routine that we miss the significance of what God wants to do in this season. I think there's beauty in this this rhythm to say, okay, Advent is a moment of anticipation. It's a moment of preparation. So be intentional in that. And what would it look like this week if every day we got up and prayed a a 10 second prayer? God, what do you want to form in me? What is it you're saying and speaking into my life? What do you want to shape in me? Secondly, I want us to wrestle with this question. How does God want to work through me? It's not just what God wants to form and shape in you, but maybe God wants to work through you to impact the lives of other people. And finally, I want us to wrestle with this question. How can I bear witness to the truth of God to other people? I think Advent is, is filled with stories of proclamation. It's the angel proclaiming to Joseph. It's uh, Gabriel proclaim, proclaiming to Mary. It's the angels appearing to the shepherds. It's proclamation, proclamation, proclamation. And maybe God wants to use you to speak the truth of righteous living and the hope of the gospel into the life of someone else. And the hope of that is that disruption is not a season where everything is thrown out the window. It is a season where God is inviting us into a place of deeper discipleship and he is unfolding something purposeful. So let me leave you with this. Don't let a season of disruption pass you by without being aware of the divine possibilities of what God wants to unfold. This morning, we're gonna respond by taking communion. And, And honestly, I don't know if I can think of a better, more appropriate way to respond in this moment. Because in partaking of communion together, what we're doing is we're remembering the arrival of Jesus. We're remembering that his ultimate mission was to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And so we're going to partake of that together uh, right now. On your way in, hopefully you grabbed communion elements. Uh, The wafer and juice are all in one. If you didn't, um, we've got some ushers that are going to come around. You can make eye contact with them or wave your hand and they would be happy to pass out some elements uh, to you. But here's what I want to do. As we get ready to take communion, I want to give us a moment just to quiet our hearts, right? I, I want there to be a moment of, of holy disruption right now. Let, let's set aside the normal course of things, enter into this prayerful moment. And, and maybe you go, I'm not even sure where to start. Start here. God, what do you want to form in me? Just begin thinking and pray, God, what is it you want to do in me in this season? What, what are you saying to me? What are you speaking in me? What is it in my journey of discipleship, Jesus? What do you want to do in this present moment, in this present season? Take a moment to pray and reflect on that. And when I come back, we'll partake of the elements together as a community.
this moment. We serve open communion, which means you don't need to be a member. Uh, all we ask is that you know and are walking with Jesus. And if that's the case, you're welcome and free to participate with us. I think this is such an appropriate response because communion is such a tangible reminder that Jesus has come and has already paid the penalty for our sin. Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. That's what we rightly deserve because of our rebellion against the God of all creation. Because as scripture says, we all like sheep have gone astray. And yet Jesus demonstrated his love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so as we partake of communion, what we're celebrating is the arrival and the coming of Jesus who's already paid the final redemptive price for our sins. And we, we turn our eyes towards the future in hope that that same savior will return again. And so Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. And so this morning, I encourage you to take the bread in the joy and hope that his broken body means our redemption and healing and wholeness. In the same way, after dinner, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. And a covenant is a sacred vow between God and his people that he will be our God and we will be his people. And so this is a beautiful symbol of reconciliation and redemption and the restoration of relationship. And so as you take the cup and drink, rejoice in the reconciliation that we have back to the heart of the Father. You may take the cup. to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of being able, able to gather as a worshiping community. God, we're thankful this morning for your, your grace that even in a season of disruption, God, we have opportunities to encounter your grace in very real and tangible ways. God, I pray that right now as, as we continue to navigate the world in which we live and as we continue to walk through a season of disruption, God, I pray, I ask that you would grace us to be a people who live and respond like Joseph, that we would set our lives down deep on the foundational uh, ways and words of you, Jesus. I pray that we would be a people like Joseph in your grace and in the power of your spirit who can respond with receptivity and obedience even in the middle of disruption. And God, I pray that we as your people, that we would be beacons of hope and truth and redemption in a world and culture that so desperately needs you. The people would look at us and say, why, why do you have joy even in the middle of difficult things? And God, give us words in that moment to bear witness to the hope of redemption that you bring. Father, I pray now that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear, that as we enter this season of Advent, that we would be purposely reflective about the work that you want to form and shape and do in us and through us, Jesus. Father, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.